good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to this space, which uh, will be about uh, proof of work in general. Uh, welcome, David. Uh, David Vorek is with us uh, tonight, which I'm really happy to uh, be able to have this conversation with David. Uh, David, I already uh, sent you an invite for uh, to speak. By the way, uh, just to repeat, uh, in on Twitter Spaces, you always need to use uh, um, to use uh, your uh, smartphone in in order to be able to talk. You cannot talk with uh, on your web uh, web application for Twitter. And um, you know, uh, today I will be able to uh, talk with David about this very. Uh, intricate field, which for me it was really always hard to comprehend, which is um, the relationship between uh, cryptocurrencies in general and uh, the hardware world, so to speak. And David is really uh, in a unique position because uh, he, as a lead developer for Sia Coin, would also enter the uh, ethic production um or ethic production field so uh i don't know many uh i this is really a unique case that i know of at least for for someone doing that so he david really can offer a unique perspective on on the intersection between uh these two so uh because they are the disparate um let's say points of view um like myself i was um I was following cryptocurrency more from a purely, you know, purely, let's say, software perspective. So I wasn't thinking uh, as an investor, I wasn't thinking like what actually goes in on the goes on on the hardware side of things. So this has I, I actually began reflecting, reflecting upon this only in the last few years, because uh, in the Decred community, we we had some, let's say, um, we had some. Um, we had a problematic related to that, and uh, I briefly, my introduction, let's say, to to mining was actually a um, long time ago with GPU mining when I was uh, uh, when I started GPU mine Litecoin and so on. Uh, but then I quickly found out that you know it's uh, it's too much of a. Um, uh, you need to specialize in this. I quickly noticed. Uh, but, you know, uh, I would like to ask you, David, first, uh, and welcome, David, and I would like you would like to ask you, as a SIA uh, developer, how did you, like, what mental process led you to decide that you want to go into the uh, ASIC, ASIC production uh, uh, field? Sure. Um, first of all, can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. Excellent. Um, so, yeah, the... Original drive to make ASICs for SIA was actually the threat of Bitmain and, and how much centralization we had seen in Bitcoin, in Litecoin, and in other cryptocurrencies. And so we felt like um, if we wanted to defend SIA, the best play was to make ASICs ourselves and, and let it be a community-centered uh, movement. We, we wanted decentralization among the, mi the mining hardware rather than uh, basically to be another coin in Bitmain's pocket. Um, so that's that's basically where it got started. I see, I see. One of the things, you know, that really, uh, if I just go directly into it, you know, directly into the problematic of everything, you know, let, let me ask you just clearly, like, directly. Do, you know, because this, uh, these companies that produce ASICs, they're basically producing uh, money printing machines, so to speak, right? <laughs> Would that be a fair assessment of things? And then one one asks, you know, okay, if you're producing a money money printing machine, why would you why would you uh, sell the money printing machine, right? So uh, why wouldn't you just print your own money first, right? So does that happen? And uh, what's your experience uh, uh, related to that? Yeah. So there's basically one reason. No, I'll say there's two reasons why you would sell a money printing machine. Um, the more generous reason 
Um, and unfortunately, not the more common reason, but certainly the more generous one is that it takes power to operate a money printing machine. Uh, you need data centers, you need cheap electricity, you need coordination and uptime, and you need you know technicians if, if machines go offline. And so if you're running a large mining farm that takes a considerable amount of expertise, um, and so if you, the manufacturer, don't have that expertise, it makes sense to sell the machines to someone who does. And so uh, basically, if they, if they can operate the machines cheaper than you can, um, you can sell the machines to many uh, to the operators for a higher price than you would expect to earn by operating themselves because your you know your costs would be higher than theirs um, and so there's like this uh, I guess service that happens so the operators are effectively providing a service to the manufacturer um, so under under all situations the manufacturer is going to sell the money printing machine for as much money as possible they're, they're not gonna you know it's, it's, it's not really smart to sell it for cost if you know that the supply and demand mechanics uh, make it so that uh, it's worth more than you're selling it for. You should you should sell it for what it's worth. Um, the less generous reason and most of the reason that you see manufacturers selling ASICs to operators is because they believe that the operators are going to be willing to pay more for the machine than the machine is worth. Um, and this often happens owing to in asymmetry and in information between the manufacturer and the operator. Um, Bitmain ran this, I, I would call it a scam. Bitmain ran this scam dozens, if not hundreds of times, um, where basically they would make a small batch of machines followed up by a large batch of machines. They would sell the small batch of machines, give everyone the impression that, you know, in total, like say five or 6,000 ASICs had been produced. That means that if you do the math, each ASIC is going to be making $500 a month, and it seems like a really good deal. But if you, uh, but but then what they actually did was they made 50,000 machines and they sold all 50,000 machines to people who thought there were only 5,000 machines on the market. And now you have 50,000 people making $50 a month each, because um, again, mining is a zero sum game. The whole market gets wiped out, but the manufacturer is doing extremely well because, you know, the total, the total pie, the total amount of money up for grabs was say 30 million bucks. Manufacturers sold 50,000 machines at $2,000 each. Their rake is a hundred million dollars. Um, that comes directly at the loss of their customers. But again, they're playing on information asymmetry. And so generally speaking, um, just my advice to consumers is like, it's an extremely rigged, unfair game you cannot win. If you are not a manufacturer yourself, just don't play. Um, and then Bitmain's taken that a couple steps further by just being absolutely brutal with their manufacturing techniques um, and identifying competition and, and just economically crushing them by overproducing machines and taking losses themselves. And, and so even as a manufacturer, it's like if you're going to make machines and Bitmain's going to compete with you, um, make sure that you have an unfair advantage over Bitmain. And um, yeah, so I, I would say in general, it's a pretty bleak situation from the perspective of like, can the community get involved in ASICs? And I would say under, under the current environment, I would just advise against it. Um, and we can talk about a lot of things from here, but yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. That's really interesting. So basically... Uh... In the article which I just shared, um, which uh, you wrote about this uh, on the SIA Tech blog, you mentioned also there was some other, um, let's say, at least um, not th that you don't have a direct evidence of, but that you suspect there was a there was some unfair play from Bitpain, basically like a uh, Chinese manufacturer manufacturer uh, in the last moment notifying you that they won't uh, manufacture for you did i get that right yeah that's correct and that's something that again a lot of manufacturers have run into um if you are doing business in china or with tsmc um there was a lot of suspicion again i don't think any hard evidence came forward but a lot of like soft evidence and suspicion that bitmain was uh pressuring its suppliers 
um, both the chip manufacturer, but also uh, uh, and especially contract manufacturers, the people making actual like boards and chassis and stuff um, would basically pressure them and say, if you want us to continue doing business with you instead of one of your competitors, um, you need to drop this customer. Um, and we, we suspect that happened to us. Um, and so we, we ended up not manufacturing with TSMC and we ended up not manufacturing in China. We built everything in the United States. Um, we had a Chinese manufacturer lined up. It was a lot cheaper. They dropped us inexplicably. Um, we suspect Bitmain was involved in that conversation because again, they didn't, they didn't give us any reason that made sense. Um, they just said, yeah, we're not, we're not doing this. We, we are backing out of this deal. And so, um, we had to scramble to find a new manufacturer. Um, and yeah, Bitmain is well known to, to play basically as, as dirty as possible. Um, they, they just want money. Um, they don't care about reputation because when you make, when your business is making money printing machines, you don't need a reputation. You have a money printing machine. Um, so right. yeah, it's, it's a very, very cutthroat world. I see. I mean, uh, I guess Bitmain's, uh, like let's say what they're known for, or what they're good at, it's how fast they can bring a product to market, right? I mean that that's really impressive, isn't it? Yeah, um, certainly one of their huge advantages was just uh, they had a whole pipeline. It was very streamlined. I don't know exactly what all went into it, but we know based on observations, uh, leaks from employees, and and other hints. Uh, we suspect that they had their two market time down to about five months. Um, and we, and we suspect that they, in some cases were even at four months, which is about as fast as you could possibly do it. And we, we think that they were actually capable of turning out brand new mining machines, um, in four months. And, and again, that just made them a monster to compete with. And, and oftentimes you wouldn't, uh, you know, they would make they would make a miner within four months, but they wouldn't sell it because of that time old question. Why sell a money printing machine? And so if if you've only made, say, 5000 units and those units are producing two thousand dollars a month each, there's absolutely no reason for you to sell those units. There's no reason for you to disclose that they exist. There's no reason for you, for you to disclose to your competitors that you actually have a completely working production pipeline. Again, you want your competitors to spend as much money as possible to complete bringing their own product to market. And then once, once that product's at market, um, you just dump on them. You, you know, when, once they've spent all the money and they're committed, uh, you, you know, undercut them by a couple of months, you release all your machines. And so, yeah, a, a lot of times it would look like Bitmain's timeline was like, eight months, they took eight months to bring the product out. But then you go and you look at the blockchain, you look at the nonce patterns, and you're like, wait a minute, these Bitmain machines have actually been mining for four months. Um, and th there weren't very many of them, but they were 70% of the hash rate. And uh, Bit Bitmain just basically was a very, uh, very competent predator, is what I would say. They were super predatory, uh, super predatorial and super good at what they did. Uh, this is a really good um, way of putting it, like you said, com very competent predator. Yeah, um, and um, I mean, th this is like this was my, uh, you know, red pill. I was a little bit naive when it came to proof of work mining. I always saw it, you know, as this most egalitarian, most perfect way of, um, because let, let's say that uh, the, the function of proof of work, right, if it's security and distribu distribution, right, of uh, of the supply. And I always saw it as the most fair and so on. But then uh, these, realities, these realities you're describing like uh, opened my eyes to, to many things that I wasn't really paying much attention to. And yeah, this aspect of, you know, the manufacturer mining the, for themselves first is, uh, is pretty problematic. Don't you think that it's, uh, it raises a good question whether, you know, um, proof of work is even viable as a solution for not for Bitcoin, of course, for Bitcoin, it would be an exception, but for altcoins and especially, you know, altcoins that are, that are coming now into the space. Don't you think that what, we do, what we're describing here um, really raises the question if it's even viable as a consensus and distribution mechanism for new altcoins? Yes, so that was the fascinating conclusion um, that, that we ended up reaching. So once, once we knew a lot more about 
the the proof of work industry and how ASICs get distributed. Um, you know, we worked on the game theory and and tried to map out, and and we essentially ended up asking the question: What happens if you have, um, what I would call an unstable monopoly miner uh, who runs your network? And so, unstable means that if they are uh, sufficiently abusive, they could be replaced by a different monopoly miner. So they they have to spend money, they have to work. It's it's not like a free monopoly. Uh, but generally speaking, as, as long as they're competent and trying, um, nobody's going to be able to topple them. And, and so the question was, does that still create an incentive-aligned, secure proof-of-work network? And uh, surprisingly, the answer came out to be yes, it does. It creates a, a consensus-aligned, secure proof-of-work network to have a monopoly miner. Um, and yeah, so so I would I would say that even with Bitmain playing as dirty as it did, Bitmain is still uh, tethered by basically one important fact, which is that at the end of the day, the protocol can decide to fork them out and replace all of their hardware, all of their expensive hardware with a different algorithm um, and favor some other provider in a sort of protectionist move. Um and Bitmain has to basically be a good enough actor to avoid that consequence. Um, and so, yeah, in, in general, I would say, though, though I strongly advise consumers just never, never buy hardware from a manufacturer um, because, because the game is so brutal and the information is so asymmetric, um, even though you're going to end up with basically one centralized miner, that's okay. And uh, the proof of work system still, still function just fine under a single centralized miner. So long as the option remains open to hard fork and, and push that miner out. Um, if that option isn't open, like it's just politically never going to happen that there's going to be a hard fork. Um, it's a bit, it's a bit more tenuous, but um, I, I don't think that's something we really have to worry about in modern cryptocurrency because there are so many so many cryptocurrencies that you can migrate to. And so if, if one cryptocurrency is being dominated by a bad miner, people will just move on to the next cryptocurrency or to the next blockchain. Um, and so the, the miner still like has general incentives to be aligned with the cryptocurrency because because they have a revenue stream connected with the cryptocurrency's health. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. You know, uh... Another another question I have for you, David. Before um, anyone else wants to ask questions, just please uh, let me know. Request uh, speaker status. But you know, um, you uh, you like us in the Decred community. You know, we we who have been with Decred since the beginning, we were all really very much skeptic about uh, ASIC resistance. You know. It was always something that um, we, as a community, didn't really believe in it, or let's say we didn't we didn't believe that that's a that's a viable path. Also, because you know we've seen how it went with other coins, like let's say Litecoin started as an ASIC resistant project, right? But then after you know the um, GPU. I mean, no, it started even as a CPU only mine coin, if I'm not mistaken, if I remember well. But then GPU mining quickly came and then the ASICs and so on. So we, we saw this story many times, right? How something started as an, as an ASIC resistant project and then, because it's always post possible to customize hardware and so on. Um, so the, the create community went to the, to the other direction, the direction of ASIC friendliness let's let's say the idea was like asic resistance doesn't work anyway so let's just embrace a asics and uh and uh, accept that that's the that's the way things have to go um because you know the problem with the, of course with the, uh, trying to be asic resistance is then then you can get like this hidden asics right <laughs> which is even worse you can get some a small group of people using asics and nobody the network isn't even aware of it so that's 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 a really bad scenario, and I think it happened with Monero and so on. And I and I'm from reading your uh, blog posts, I think you 
you have the same, or at least you had the same perspective on ASIC resistance. But, you know, I think many in the Decred community um, have begun, you know, questioning that because for two reasons. One is that, um, yeah, one is that what ha what we saw happen with the, with the, with our situation with uh, ASICs and um, and uh, you know like we like we discussed how centralized and even rigged the game is. And on the other hand, by seeing uh, random X being apparently, I mean Monero's random X apparently being rather you know consistently ASIC resistant. So my question to you is, David, uh, would you still do you still have the same perspective on ASIC resistance, or has it changed in any way? No, I still have the same perspective on ASIC resistance. I think uh, it's an unachievable goal. I think Monero's um, main success in maintaining ASIC resistance is actually the size of their block reward. You, you can't actually make that much money mining Monero. And as a result, uh, you know, make, making a random X ASIC that is sufficiently competitive to be worth producing i've i haven't done the math in a while but when i last did the math i computed that it would, it would be you need to make something like 60 million dollars worth of hardware um to be convincingly competitive and then and then that means that the monero block reward needs to be uh you know with within however long you can stay in secret and not get detected and not get the community suspicious um, you need you need to be able to recover that sixty million dollar investment plus whatever returns. And so, you know, if if the Monero block reward isn't somewhere in the ballpark of a hundred million dollars per year, which it's not, uh, that in itself is going to be a sick resistance. So if if you, I think that you can take a strategy of ASIC resistance as a bootstrapping mechanism and expect it to hold out for a while. But as, as soon as your token becomes super valuable, um, ASICs are going to show up in, in one form or another. Um, the other thing that you really risk when you have ASIC resistance, and, and Monero risks this um, and, and has run into this multiple times, um, is botnet exposure and uh, what's it called? nice hash exposure. Um, and so someone with a large botnet can mine a ton of Monero, can double spend. Someone with a big, nice hash bank can also mine Monero and double spend. And, and when you are in the world of GPUs, uh, unlike when you're in the world of ASICs, the people who own the GPUs, if, if they end up, say, double spending Monero, trashing it, and Monero dies because it's been double spent so many times, um, they don't lose anything because they can just point their GPU to something else profitable. They can sell it for AI. They can. They used to be able to mine Ethereum. That's gone. But there are enough GPU coins out there, and and now that AI is on the scene, there's enough ways to make money selling your GPU to AI that it became um, more or less irrelevant. Uh, or yeah, it's it's more or less more or less irrelevant to you whether one particular source of income disappears. And so you. You have this problem when you're GPU friendly or CPU friendly that you're just really cheap to attack because the cost of attack is the operating expenses, not the capital expenses. When you are in ASIC, uh, in ASIC back token, though, the cost of attacking you is the capital expenses, and it includes the cost of the hardware as well because that hardware is by design unable to point at anything else. Oh, interesting. But um, just returning a little bit to ra random X, do you believe like uh... It just the you know from a fundamental perspective, do you believe it? It's even possible to say that an algorithm would be really ASIC resistant. No, I don't believe it's possible. Um, and and basically, here's the reason why. Um, so, an ASIC fundamentally is just a bunch of logic gates. Um, and in the world of ASICs, they've been hyper optimized to meet one specific set of criteria, one one specific algorithm. So. Um, when you talk about something like uh, how a CPU does SHA-256, it does an add operation, and then you have a clock cycle, and it goes back to the top of the CPU register, and it comes through, and it does you know a bit shift, and it does some XORs, and there's like this very complicated pipeline because the CPU needs to be able to do 
a large, like, very wide array of things. And so the CPU, after every addition, it has this like reset where it can go and do anything else. And that's that reset is very expensive. When you have a SHA-256 ASIC, what you basically do is you cut out all the resets, you cut out all the extra gates, and you make it just this very streamlined uh, set of electrical signals. And it's much faster. It's much. It costs much less energy. It takes much less space per computation. And so you just make and and the, the performance gains tend to be a factor of a thousand. Um, so the main idea behind ASIC resistance is like you look at a target piece of hardware, either a CPU or a GPU. I think RandomX looks at CPUs, although I'm not a hundred percent. I'm not a hundred percent sure on whether RandomX targets CPUs or GPUs. So I'm going to say GPUs. Um, cause that's what I would try for if I were, if I were to build random X, but you look at the instructions on, on the GPUs and it's like, okay, GPUs can do ads. They can do matrix multiplication. They have these like shaders. And so you, you look at how those instructions work and you try to design the algorithm such that you have to use basically the full capability of the GPU in order to complete the algorithm. And so so that's the main idea behind random X is that it's like actually the algorithm itself is like a whole CPU. And depending on what your seed is, you you know, the CPU is going to have all this like branching and and arbitrary uh, arbitrary it's going to have an arbitrary process to produce the computation. And that's something that in order to replicate in an ASIC, you basically end up having to make your ASIC look like a GPU. And so uh, the goal of an algorithm like RandomX, again, is to take a target piece of hardware, look at how that hardware works, and then make it so that the optimal hardware would match the target hardware. Um, and so that's where you get most of your advantage. But the reason why it never works all the way is because general purpose hardware is just fundamentally designed to operate in different conditions than mining hardware. Typically, especially if it's a consumer piece of hardware, um, it's going to have temperature tolerances. It's going to be optimized to run fast rather than to run power efficient. Um, and you're, you're generally not pushing the gates as far as you possibly can. If you're making mining hardware, you can narrow your constraints a lot more. You, you know that the temperature, temperature tolerances are different. You know that you're targeting a super low voltage um, and, and you can make all these customizations that fit into this like neat little mining envelope. You can make all these expectations like, um, for example, consumer hardware needs to be pretty reliable. Mining hardware, it's fine if it breaks um, because you care much more about expected value overall rather than caring about you know, making sure that when a consumer buys a GPU, that GPU is gonna last several years. Um, to keep the consumer happy. In, in mining, you really don't care if one of your GPUs breaks uh, in three months or in two months, as long as on average, they work super well. Um, and so basically, because mining is fundamentally like more curated and more targeted and more focused, the hardware engineer that's trying to optimize the circuit can take a lot of shortcuts that simply aren't available to the hardware engineer who's trying to design a CPU. Um, and so in the end, you know, the, the advantage that a custom ASIC for random X has over, uh, a GPU is going to be, you know, maybe 30% or 50%. Whereas the advantage that a custom ASIC for SHA-2 is like I said, like a thousand X. And so the, because your advantage is only like 30% to 50%, as opposed to a thousand X, the amount of machines that you need to produce and, and the cost advantage that you need to have, like the equation changes a bunch. Um, it's still there, but the equation changes a bunch. And, and so it's it's a lot more expensive. And so RandomX is, um, yeah, ASIC resistant, but it's not ASIC proof. Um, and, then, and then the other thing that I guess I can touch on that I missed, the other like big optimization is that when you're building an ASIC for mining purposes, you can expect it to be in a rig, right? A GPU is going to be in a GPU card, and then that has all of its own overheads. An ASIC is going to be in a mining machine where the heatsink situation is different, like the fan situation is different, how it's mounted to the server is different. And, and again, there are just a lot more, you have a lot more wiggle room to create optimizations and 
uh, performance shortcuts that would never fly in a consumer GPU or, or even a server GPU. Uh, that's really interesting. So yes, uh, yeah, it's always possible to, um, you know, improve with custom hardware. But, um, you know, we, we were discussing a little bit about uh, the decred angle, like the decred situation, uh, how it was with mining and so on. Um, was it, uh, were there any, let's say, were there anything specific that was different making the decred ASICs from the SIA ASICs? From our perspective, no. Um, from the from the actual engineer's perspective, it was like two completely separate projects. But then the chips that they produced were basically the same the same chip. Um, the you know the the etching was different, but we we plugged them into the machines the same way. They consumed roughly the same amount of power, um, and so yeah, it, it was it was basically just like making making one thing twice. Uh, but the main main competitor for uh, the Decred miner back then was uh, was it Bitmain or was it uh, Halong? I think. Yeah, so Bitmain was first to market, and Halong was best to market. Uh, if that makes sense, uh, Halong did better research, made a more optimized circuit, and used a more uh, a more modern process, and so uh, they got basically a, mu- a much more optimized chip produced. Um, but I think Bitmain, Bitmain eventually took back that crown. Uh, who was their fab at that time? I believe Halong used uh, Samsung 14 nanometer and Bitmain used TSMC 28 nanometer. We, we also discussed a little bit in the DMs. Uh, you know, um, I told you about like the, the decred because of the because of mining centralization and so on. Uh, this decided to to switch a little bit. I mean, to shift uh, rewards from uh, proof of work to proof of stake. Uh, and I wonder, like, what's your take on this? Because I think you you don't, uh, let's say, um, you aren't an um, supporter of proof of stake, right? Yeah, I'm not a not personally a huge fan of proof of stake, but um, I recognize the advantages. I, I just for me, proof of stake. Um, I, I don't like how abstract the protection is. Uh, just just for example, like the the main protection that comes from both proof of stake and proof of work is the theoretical amount of money that a bad actor stands to lose if they attack the system. But in proof of work, you have this like very clean revenue stream. You have these ASICs that are worth you know a certain amount of money. If you want to exit. You can sell those ASICs to someone else, and because because these ASICs are associated with the revenue stream, you'll get a really good price. In proof of stake, um, the revenue stream is typically a lot lower per per dollar of capital because uh, your competitors aren't just people who spent capital purely for the sake of returns, but but also your your competition is people who own Decred because they are. You know, like the product, they they may they may not even be bullish on Decred, right? They may think that Decred's probably going to go down, but because they like the project and want to use the token, they own it anyway, right? And so your uh, your competition, as someone who is staking, is super super intense, and so you generally aren't going to stake unless you're bullish on the project because the staking revenue is just really low. There are so many people that you're competing with for staking revenue; the revenue is super low. And so the revenue itself from staking does not give you value. And then if the exit liquidity is also really low, right? The, the token just doesn't have a lot of trading volume on it. Um, you can end up in situations where someone who has ostensibly $35 million worth of stake looks at a, a double spend attack that they could commit and thinks to themselves, this double spend attack would net me three hundred thousand dollars it's worth doing it because even though the market value of my tokens is supposedly 35 million if i were to to sell them all i would just dump the market i would would never be able to exit that much um and so yeah you basically you um it's it's just much harder to analyze exactly who the potential attackers are what their motives are what their revenues are like what their incentives are uh, proof of stake is just like this big murky world of assumptions that you simply can't validate. And so, while it's completely possible to have 
safe proof of stake systems and and we could probably assume most of the proof of stake systems that are live today are safe it's very difficult to to get like a concrete analysis that says you know this this is how much money an attacker is going to lose if they attempt to attack the network that it, that that analysis just doesn't exist in proof of stake where it does exist and is very concrete in proof of work. But um, part of what we talked about in the DM was like, uh, apparently there was a big controversy where, where someone analyzed the block rewards and basically concluded uh, these miners are dumping decred. So we're giving them a bunch of decred and rather than the miners being aligned um, and holding on to the token and, and expecting growth, they're just they're just dumping it and cashing out as fast as possible, and and it's suppressing the decred price. Um, and I have two thoughts on that. Uh, the the first one is that even though they are dumping, they are still aligned. Um, so the fact that they are selling their tokens as soon as they get them does not mean that they are not aligned with the decred ecosystem. And that's because the decred e- ecosystem is very dependent on getting future revenue or sorry not the decred the miner is very dependent on getting future revenue out of the decred ecosystem so they need to keep the decred ecosystem healthy and they want to see decred grow because then their mining revenues will also grow or at, at the very least they don't want to see it decrease because if decred's price goes down their mining revenues go down um, and so they are aligned even though they're selling immediately however they're not aligned to hold because they have expenses. And also they probably see, you know, almost certainly see Decred more as a cash cow than they do as a long-term investment. Um, and so, yeah, the the fact that they are dumping all the coins that they mine is not surprising at all to me. I, th- I think that's a behavior you should generally expect from miners. And if if your economic model doesn't you know, is assuming that most people who are receiving the block rewards will be retaining the tokens, um, then it then it does make sense to, you know, deprioritize the miners. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that uh, the discovery that Decred miners were dumping all of the tokens they were mining is not a surprising discovery at all. It, it really makes sense with, with my understanding of how the mining ecosystem works. Right, right. But that, that is, uh, let's say, that is a difference between um, proof of work and proof of stake in this case, right, for, um, for an altcoin. That uh, in Decred's case, you know, proof of stake, you need to lock your coins for a certain amount of time. So you would expect a different kind of alignment, right? Because you, you're locking coins for, uh, for uh, up to four months, right? Yeah, again, the proof of work miner is still aligned. It's just they're selling. Whereas I think it is it is generally reasonable to assume that people who hold enough decred to make material uh, amounts of revenue from staking um, probably hold a lot of decred because they expect it to go up, not because they want the staking revenue. And therefore, they're likely to continue to hold as they receive revenue because because they're you know they're bullish and and so they. They're gonna keep. They're gonna keep their staking rewards. Right, right, right. You you make a good point. Yeah, uh, not aligned wasn't uh, wasn't quite right. Yeah, it's just uh, yeah, it's a different behavior when it comes to selling, and uh, yeah, it impacts the the coin differently, right? Um, unfortunately, if uh, if there's uh, basically constant dumping from uh, the miners, uh, it creates an impression that basically the project isn't interesting, right? Like. It keeps falling in price, so people lose interest and so on. It creates a, a kind of a feedback loop, which is not very favorable for the project. So my question also would be, okay, knowing these things we know now, right, uh, about you know how the mining game works and so on, uh, what would, if you're not, uh, you told me that you're not actively following the Decred project so much, maybe, um, but let's say in general for uh, projects like Sia Coin or you know Digibyte, Decred, all these all these coins that had this issue, let's say with proof of work mining centralization, what would be your 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 take or your advice for uh, for our communities? Let's say. Yeah, so I, I would say, generally speaking, don't sweat the mining centralization. Um, keep an eye out, like make. Make sure that you have the ability to detect whether or not the miner is doing a double spend attack. But as long as they aren't, um, having a fully centralized miner 
under the proof of work model is is actually typically okay. Expect them to dump all the coins they get. And so if if you don't want them to dump a ton of coins, then you know controlling you know limiting the amount of block reward that goes to them is uh, something you should consider. Um, and then I think the the other big one is have set an expectation with the community that you will fork if uh, the miner misbehaves and you know set set very explicit criteria. The easy the easy criteria is like if there's a double spend attack, then we're gonna fork. Other criteria would be like if one miner gets over fifty percent hash rate, then we'll then we'll fork. Um, I don't recommend I don't recommend that as a criteria. I, I mostly recommend focusing on just double spend attacks. And otherwise, um, I think it's fine if you have a miner that's got like ninety percent of the hash rate. As as long as the hash rate is high, then that's okay. Um, and I, I would just embrace that, and I would choose a block reward that you're comfortable with all of those tokens being sold rather than than hoarded or collected. Yeah, thank you. That's uh, that makes sense. Yeah, thank you so much for being with us and sharing your uh, interesting insights. And I really hope we can. Uh, do this again um, some other time. Absolutely, and uh, yeah, I'd, I look forward to coming back. And it's totally fine with me if you uh, turn this into a video, um, and, and we can publish it, and I'll retweet it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right, guys. Uh, see you next time, and uh, good night. Have a good night.